Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. You're listening to Cup of Parenting podcast and I'm your host Aisha, a pediatric speech and language therapist, mom of seven and parenting coach here in the UK. This week I'm joined by Nazia Rizwan. Nazia is a principal speech and language therapist for developmental language disorder based in London. She has worked in diverse communities for around 15 years. Nazia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me, Aisha. I'm glad to be able to talk about developmental language disorder. Yeah, I'm just going to start off by saying, Nazia, so on October the 15th, so that's not far away at all, is Developmental Language Disorder Awareness Day. Now, in 2020, 83 buildings and monuments around the world were lit up in purple and yellow for DLD. So, I'm just going to start off by asking you a really obvious question, Nazia, for our listeners. Can you just tell us what DLD actually is? Yes, sure. So DLD, it stands for something called a developmental language disorder. So what this is, is it's a diagnosis which is given by speech and language therapists. And it is when a child or a young person has had persistent difficulties with acquiring language skills. So these often include difficulties with understanding what people are saying, with expressing and articulating their thoughts and their feelings and ideas, with learning new words and vocabulary and using an appropriate range of grammar. So when we think about DLD um, or developmental language disorder, What's also important to um, bear in mind is that this diagnosis is given only when there's no other obvious explanations for the difficulties that they're presenting with. So if it's known, for example, that they've got a genetic or a chromosomal or a congenital um, condition or a syndrome like Down syndrome, you know, anything else which might affect their profile of language needs then that wouldn't be DLD because Mm. that's explaining why they present like that likewise some children might be autistic so if they are on the autism spectrum disorder part of having um, autism quite often includes having some language difficulties so although you do have the language disorder there what we're talking about here is when there aren't any other obvious reasons why the child has these difficulties so that's what DLD is it's when there's nothing else that can explain why they're having these needs but it's very specific to the way in which they use and understand language yeah thank you so much for such a detailed explanation um Nazia so if there are any parents out there who are sort of thinking you know, that sounds a little bit familiar or it could be something that my child has or a child that I know. What would be the route? What what does that look like in terms of what can a parent do to sort of, you know, make sure that the child gets a diagnosis or even rule it out? Because like you said, it's quite specific. Yeah, so I guess for parents, the first thing you would want to think about is, you know, could my child have DLD? So I'm guessing that's what a lot of your listeners might be thinking, if Mm. maybe you're slightly concerned about your child's communication skills. So there are things you can look out for and a few triggers and warning signs. So when we think about little children, so say the under fives, one of the obvious things you might notice is that your child's not talking. So Mm. typically we would expect children to start saying their first words by around between 12 to 18 months. And then around age two, they're beginning to put two words together or so. So if you do have a toddler and they're still not yet speaking and they don't have any words, then that could be a warning sign. So that could be an indication perhaps speak to your health visitor, go to your GP if you're worried that they're not quite talking. Um, I guess for a school-age child, you might notice again that their talking isn't quite the same as other children around their age. If you've got other children, particularly, you know, older children, you might naturally try to compare and although we you know we want to try our best not to compare against other children and any siblings you can't help but do it and obviously as parents you do look at your child and others and it's not nice but 
you do that that's only natural so yeah. I guess I would say trust your gut instinct as well if you feel like your child isn't fully understanding what you're saying you notice you're having to repeat yourself quite a lot because they're not quite understanding your question or your instruction the first time if you're struggling to understand what they're saying um, that's a bit of a warning sign as well if you notice they're getting upset and frustrated you know quite often you want to think not necessarily about what exactly is the language skills and abilities like but what is the impact of that difficulty so if your child is you know crying a lot because they can't tell you that they're hungry if mm. they're getting angry or cross or it seems like they're always having a tantrum you need to think about you know what is it that they're trying to communicate and why are they struggling to communicate is that due to a potential language difficulty there um so yeah just I guess from a from a parent's point of view just have a think is there any time where you're struggling to understand them they're struggling to communicate with you and it's leading to lots of communication breakdowns and it's causing upset and frustration that would be I would say the right time for you to either raise it with your GP or health visitor or if your child is school age speak to your teacher or the special educational needs coordinator in your school to try to um, recommend a speech language therapy referral. Mm, So I guess it's all about being like quite perceptive and tuned in and I guess parents are usually quite good at doing that aren't they they'll sort of uh, you know know when their child isn't developing typically and think about is there anything that I need to do if it gets to a stage where there's alarm bells going off or there's red flags and they're thinking, you know, my child isn't um, talking or isn't doing certain things? Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, as parents, you don't, you know your child the best. Mm. So you, you know if there's something not quite right. But then also, likewise, as parents, you're not experts in typical development and you're not meant to be unless you've actually you know trained or you're you know that's part of your role um but I would say if in doubt go to your GP speak to the professionals because no harm can come out of asking people for advice if if anything it can only help you because you're getting the right information and right support sooner rather than waiting until it's you know um you know gone on for a couple of months or a couple of years so yeah I would say go with your gut feeling if something's not quite right then just raise it if anything it might just give you reassurance even to say it's absolutely fine for your two-year-old not to be talking in full perfect sentences don't worry about that um but so what it's giving you that reassurance to say what you're doing is absolutely fine um so yeah I would always advise parents to feedback and raise any concerns that that you might have Mm. now Nazia do you know um when you think about DLD I know it's coming up a little bit more than it was I don't know maybe five ten years ago in the media would you say that there is enough awareness out there say for example compared to autism which we hear about a lot um or do you think more needs to be done definitely more needs to be done Mm. Um, Yeah, I imagine if we were to poll your listeners and ask them, how many people have heard of autism? Probably a lot of your listeners would have heard of it, maybe not fully confident with knowing exactly what this, what the features are or what it means, but they would have heard of it. Whereas with DLD, I'd be very surprised if, you know, more than half of your listeners would have heard of it Mm. so it's definitely not as well known as autism um but I think there are a few factors because of that so Mm. what's what's great with autism is that during the past few decades there has been more research relating to understanding autism looking at supports and interventions to help them and that's brilliant whereas with DLD it's not as well known and in fact the actual terminology was only quite recently confirmed it used to be known under various different names Mm. uh, previously also in previous decades children and young people may have been misdiagnosed as having something else which we now know to be DLD so when we look back say 50 years ago there there may have been young people who were classed as having um, a mental health condition or a mental health disorder 
when we know now it's that they had a developmental language disorder it was nothing to do with anything else mm. um or children were classed as having a severe learning disability when we know now that it is not quite that it was more specific to their language so i think there's definitely not as much awareness about dod um, and not as much in comparison to autism however when we look at prevalence dod is far more prevalent and um, widespread than we might think and in fact so much so that when we think about a typical mainstream classroom which has let's say an average about 30 children the research shows that in every typical mainstream classroom there will be about two children that have some type of speech and language difficulties and that number can increase in areas with socioeconomic deprivation so when we think about that, that's really common to have two children in every class. That's yeah. that's a lot just in, in in one school. So it's not rare. And in a way, that's that's something which should reassure parents as well, that if your yeah. child does have DOD, it's you know, it is something which you might be concerned about and it's something which we can support your child with but it's also not rare that it is something which is a lot more prevalent than you might think and it is normally about five times more prevalent than autism so yeah we definitely need to do a lot more awareness raising we need a lot more support as well so yeah definitely it's something where it's it's there it's out yeah. there we just need to spread the word yeah, and I think we're starting to do that. Like you're here today talking to us, which is fantastic. So I guess that's how you start, isn't it? Just by making, um, raising that awareness as a, as a initial step. Can I just ask Nazia? I know you've got loads of experience working in diverse communities, and a lot of our listeners are from ethnic backgrounds. What sort of what what um, is the prevalence of DLD? Do you, do we know with, within these um, certain communities and What's been your experience? Yeah, so I can't give you exact stats or figures in terms of different communities or different demographics just because that's that's not available as far as what I'm, a, I'm aware. But in terms of just anecdotally and my experience of working within multicultural communities as well, um, it's it's still prevalent, um, but... It's, I guess it's about demystifying any stigma around it and yeah. making sure that we, we kind of raise that awareness that it's not anything to, to be kind of concerned about. It's not anything where it's, it's because of the fact that it's to do with being in a multicultural community at all. And so we might even link into thinking about bilingualism as well. So just mm. to make it clear that being bilingual doesn't cause DLD. It doesn't cause any language difficulties. In fact, it's a great asset to speak yeah, more than one language. Yeah. So any opportunity I have to really draw that message is I'll, I will do it. So yeah, absolutely. If you speak another language, don't be concerned thinking, is that going to make it harder for my child to learn English? It's not. In fact, it's going to help enrich their, um, their lexicon and help them to um, grasp English if you carry on using your home language as well mm. um, I guess in terms of with DOD what's what's quite hard sometimes particularly around raising awareness is really making sure that within that community we understand what what it means and and not kind of making it um, seen as a taboo subject yeah. area you know it's it's about making it clear that you know just because you know a child might have some difficulties with understanding language it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with them you know mm. it's all about early identification which then needs to support um and not it's really hard I think obviously as a parent you want to you want the best for your child and when you've when someone points out to you particularly if you're not the one that's concerned yourself I think yeah. this is the hardest one isn't it where yeah. yes you might have the legitimate concerns about your child and so you've got all these thoughts and feelings running through your mind and you want the professional to either confirm what you're thinking yeah. and then give the support or to reassure you so then you don't need to worry about it but what's quite hard is if you weren't concerned and it was somebody else like your child's class teacher or their nursery teacher or a health visitor at an appointment but somebody else who then mentions to you that 
your child's talking isn't quite as it should be. So I'm sure that's quite a shock to the system and that can be quite hard news to hear when you weren't quite concerned. So I think what I what I would say to parents in, the, in that situation is try your best not to be alarmed because it's great that it's been identified and all the professionals want to do is just make sure that your child is getting the best support they can. Mm-hmm. And they, they're just flagging it up just to kind of make you aware that there might be something there, there might not be, but let's investigate it, refer to the speech and language therapist and see, you know, if there is any any support needed. So although it's quite hard to to hear within different communities or just as a family, I would I would just say, you know, try try not to get too stressed about it. If you've got any concerns, then just discuss it with the speech and language therapist as well um, or your class teacher. Um, so yeah, but it is really hard. I do appreciate that. Of course, yeah. As it is with with any diagnosis, when it's when it's your, as you've rightly said, a parent and it's your child, um, you obviously want the best for them all the time. Um, something I wanted to pick up on what you said uh, before was that once they then get that diagnosis, Nazia, I know you're based in London. It might vary from NHS Trust from one to another. I'm I'm all the way up north. But what kind of support might parents um, expect if their child receives a diagnosis? What does that child typically then sort of need? Yeah, so I guess there's... There's the general support in terms of what what kind of interventions we want children to have. And then you've got to think about, well, what is available in the area you live in? And yeah. unfortunately, you know, I'm sure most of your listeners might have heard of um, the term postcode lottery, where it's just really unfortunate where in some places services are better than than others. So I would say, first and foremost, if you do get referred and your child does receive a diagnosis, ask them what, what happens next, what, in, what support is available. Um, so I can't speak for every service because every service is completely different. Some sure. people use, you know, have a particular therapy package or they might do more training. So it's quite hard, but I would say talk to the person that gives the diagnosis for them to tell you what the next steps are in terms of what type of intervention in general helps to support these children we like to use um three it's quite hard to discuss in a podcast this is where yeah. I like to use visuals <laughs> yeah. but if you imagine a pyramid or a triangle mm. and you think about different tiers of services So at the bottom of that triangle, you've got the largest kind of um, space, which is universal support. And then in the middle, you've got what we call targeted support. And then right at the top, which is the the smallest pointy little bit, is the specialist support. So what we want for all children to do really well is to have a really nice combination of universal support, targeted support and specialist support. So what do we mean by those three? So universal support, that means any training, advice, um, t- specific um, inputs, which is going to help support the child and their environment. Because as much as we want the child to improve with their language skills, we also need to be mindful that we want to help make sure that the environment in which the child spends their time, whether that's in school, in nursery, in home, is as communication as, as communication friendly as possible. So universal input would be the speech and language therapy team providing lots of trainings to their school staff, providing support with differentiating lesson planning, meeting with parents and carers to do coffee mornings, providing advice around how you can support your child's communication at home. So lots of things which is around making sure that the environment is geared up to support that child. Targeted levels of input might be things around training up identified members of staff to run specific intervention groups to help your child in school. Or it might be around modelling therapy activities, which can then be carried on every day, either by somebody in school or if they're under five or, you know, uh, younger, then modelling some therapy activities that as parent or carers, you can carry on afterwards. 
And then specialist levels of input are specific direct pieces of work that the speech and language therapist themselves might do. So that will include doing your detailed assessments, reassessments, doing using your outcome measures, providing any one-to-one or direct group therapy yourself, which you feel like you can't hand it over to, to another member of staff. It has to be you yourself. So that's quite a long-winded answer to your question. But, in, mm. but to answer it, I would say there isn't one direct um, kind of package of care for DLD that is the gold standard but what is gold standard is making sure that you're doing a range of all the specialist universal and targeted levels of input um, to help your child and yeah in terms of what's available in your local service if your child is school aged then request to speak to the school senko that's a special educational needs coordinator and ask them what support is available for your child in school Um, you know what other professionals are involved you could contact your local NHS speech and language therapy service to see what they can offer or if there are any independent speech and language therapy providers in your area they might be good to inquire as well to find out um, what input they could provide. Amazing I think Nazi you described that triangle beautifully without us even needing visual so I think you did a really good job for our listeners so thank you for describing that in a lot of um, depth. Can I just ask you Nazi I know you've been practicing for a long time and you've obviously must have seen a lot of changes in terms of you know the um speech and language therapy scene itself the caseloads that you've been working with what would you say, you know, has been the most, I don't know, profound for you? Is is there any particular area or is there anything that you enjoy doing in particular? I think one of the things that I've noticed, which um, is good and not good in a way, I've noticed that caseload sizes have increased drastically. Mm. Um, When we think about my mainstream school caseloads, I am having more and more children on my caseloads that have DLD or not just DLD but general speech and language needs whether that's due to being autistic having learning disabilities or anything else but in general the count the caseloads are getting bigger now on the one hand you might think oh gosh that's really concerning why 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 are they getting bigger why are there more children but then also I think it's a positive because it means children are being identified you know these are children Mm. who 10 years ago would have been missed they would have gone through school either quietly struggling because they were masking their difficulties so what we mean by masking is they they haven't told anyone that they're struggling they're trying their best to hide their difficulties to not let it be known and so they were never picked up or these are children where they might have previously been labeled as the naughty child so when we think about triggers, going back to your, I think your first question and yeah. what signs to look out for, one of the biggest signs, particularly for a school-aged child, is those children where it might look like they have behaviour issues or it looks like they're acting out, they're being silly, they're not listening, they're choosing to defy my orders. It's really, really, really rare for a child to just be naughty for the sake of it. You know, that's that's very rare there there is often a reason why what they're doing and why they're trying to communicate it so when we think about the behaviors and actions that a child is doing Mm -hmm. we we have to interpret what is it that they're trying to communicate and why are they using this particular behavior instead of um you know their words or anything else so that's a warning sign in itself that does this child have DLD because they're struggling to communicate that they don't understand what somebody is saying or they don't understand or they can't express how they're feeling so because they can't express themselves because they might have DLD instead they're acting out Um, so previously these children wouldn't have been identified these are children that some teachers might have just labeled as a problem child and so they didn't get support but what's good is that these children I've noticed are being identified a lot a lot sooner now which is brilliant it means that we can put lots of inputs and support in place and also train training for staff members as well to help raise their awareness that 
you know, this this isn't just a child that's acting out. It's because they're having difficulties communicating um, something. So let's let's work on that. Mm, absolutely. And I just wanted to ask you, Nazia, some of our listeners aren't from the UK, so we do have listeners from abroad. If, of, of course, first and foremost, we'd advise our listeners to go out and get um, diagnosis from professionals or um, seek opinions from professionals if they are concerned and worried. Is there anywhere sort of online they can go in terms of getting more information about DLD in particular? Are there any websites that you could recommend maybe? Yeah, so I'll say the best one as your starting point is um, Raddled. So this is it's R A D L D dot org. So O R G. So that stands for Raising Awareness of Developmental Language Disorder. I would say that's the best website to go on, and they also have links to their YouTube channels. Um, and that's that's a that's a good website because it's got loads of amazing resources fact sheets, information around what what is DLD, what does it mean for my child, what tips and strategies can I do. If you go on their YouTube page, you can even watch video clips of of young people with DLD themselves talking about their experiences. And I find that's really powerful as well, just to just to hear it from um, somebody's lived experience. Mm. So yeah, I would say the rattled.org is is a good starting place. Yeah, I think that's really useful, actually, to actually um, watch videos of children who may have had a diagnosis to sort of so parents can see what it means for them as well. So that's really useful. Thank you for telling us that, Nazia. Um, I would like to thank Nazia for taking time out from her super busy schedule for joining us for today's podcast. I have found it extremely beneficial and useful, and I know our listeners would have as well. Thank you so much for having me, Aisha. Thank you. Thanks, Nazia. Bye. Bye.